Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. I'm Jay Fidel here on Think Tech. And at Think Tech, we feel that we ought to raise public awareness about matters that, that uh, have an effect on Hawaii, but matters of interest to the people of Hawaii. And one of the things we think people ought to be thinking about is, is the global. Um, that's why we try to raise uh, public awareness about, about global things. And that's why we have shows uh, ranging from India to Japan to Europe to everywhere. Because they think the people in Hawaii ought to think about those things. And therefore, that people who go to Africa, <clears throat> we don't have a show from Africa, but we know that Tim Apicella goes to Africa. <clears throat> Every year he goes to Africa, and he goes to look around. He's the only person I know who makes regular trips to Africa. And we're not talking about those safari trips where you pay a fortune and sleep in a fancy tent under the, under the stars and have champagne delivered to you. You know, not, nothing like that. He actually goes, and he goes by himself. He goes, he goes in, the, in the outback of Africa, and we really need to know what that's like. I mean, how many people in the world really know what it's like to travel in Africa on the ground. So Tim agreed to do this show with us to talk about a recent trip he took. He goes every year. This would be his, what, 2017 trip or early 2018? No, it's not quite, not quite. I've, I've been there many times, but not every year. Okay, so, well, yeah, I, I've been there so quite often. a few times. Okay. And, and you went, uh, what, just a, a month or two ago? Yeah, right. And uh, you had another successful trip in the sense you learned a lot and came back alive. This is very important. Well, coming back alive is really important, but coming back enriched is even better. Um, you know, every time I, I, I go to Africa or even, you know, anywhere, um, you really appreciate that what you have because you do see people and you see neighborhoods and you see a country that's either been decimated by poverty or decimated by civil war. And, you know, the civil war could have been 20 years ago and they're still trying to grow out of, out of the, yeah. uh, the, the carnage of war. And so when you come back, you, you have an appreciation, I think, of just how good we have it. Yeah. You also have an appreciation of, uh, you know, I guess European history and imperialism and what imperialism can do to a country. When you finally let them, let them go, liberate them, <clears throat> usually because they demand to be liberated, you find there's not a lot of, I wouldn't call it uh, political infrastructure left behind that can keep the place uh, orderly. And uh, the result is it's, a, it's chaos in a lot of those countries. A lot of them are failing countries. And that's why I admire you so much for going to those places, because there's always a certain amount of risk. I mean, it'd be risky for a businessman, but it's also very risky for a tourist on the ground. So well, I have a map, and uh, let's play the map. And you can tell us, looking at the map, where you went on this trip, Ted. Well, I, I've, been, I've covered a lot of North Africa, being Egypt, being Tunisia, Morocco. Um, then I've hit, you know, some of the Eastern African uh, countries of Tanzania and Mozambique, and then Southern Africa of South Africa, Botswana, and uh, Zimbabwe. My next, hopefully my next trip is going to be Zambia and Malawi. But um, West Africa is very difficult because um, my French is horrible. My Arabic is actually better than my French. <laughs> so most of West Africa is, is, is limiting that way because you just have a language barrier and it makes it three times harder to, you know, go the local route and try to, you know, make ends meet and, and, and make connections. And it's just so hard when you just don't speak the language. So, so Eastern Africa, you can get along on English? Well, that's where the British colonized a lot of East Africa. Um, Tanzania was a bit of an exception because it was just inhospitable as far as environment, the tsetse fly you know, disease, malaria. And so the, the British tried it for a time and the Germans did back in the early 1900s and both, both just said, we can't, we can't have, you know, colonization here in Tanzania. Kenya worked out very well for the British, you know, Mother England, but um, Mother Tanzania. England's out of the out of the region now. There's no there's no British colony left. In, 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 in government, yes, but in, in cultural, no. Um, the, the Kenyans, the Tanzanians, they still, they still put their arms around the, the, what they think are the better points of, of the colonization times. Mm -hmm. um, they're very proud of their English, and they really go to great lengths to learn proper English and speak proper English. And it's, you know, you can just tell it's a, a source of pride for, for Africans um, and how they treat their language and, and the, the old vestiges of the colonialism, I think. So why do, you, why do you go to Africa, Tim? I don't know anybody else who does what you do. Well, that's a philosophical question, and it's also, um, I, I, for me, 
I answered this on a previous show, the philosophical answer is, you know, what we get here on Earth is, we don't get that anywhere in the universe. I mean, this is it. I mean, if you don't get it here, and I mean experience, you won't get it anywhere because we've, we experience things in this, this flesh and blood that we won't experience anywhere in the universe. So we're only here for a short while. We only dance on this earth for 50, if we're lucky, 50 years, 60, 70, 70 years. And so what is, why are we here? I mean, is it to just acquire assets and accumulate possessions? Or is it to meet other people, other cultures, other experiences of commonality? Um, why are we here? And so where do you find that? You find that in the entire world. So that means you have to go throughout the entire world. And you don't mind if there's risk. There's a lot of risk. Um, some of them is known and a lot of it's unknown. Um, I think every time you get on a vehicle in Africa, <laughs> you take great risk. And it's that old thing where you see a car coming straight for you and you just, you just don't look. You just say, what will be, will be. Wow. It, you know, either it's a head on or it's not. And you know, it's disconcerting to go down a windy you know, road for, for hours and hours and hours in a third world bus where there's no tread on the tires. It looks like a smooth inner tube and you know, it's bouncing up and down. There's no shocks and you're going around hairpin turns. And every three, five, 10 miles, you'll see a burned out shell of a bus. And you know that no one survived that, that accident. And so you see this as you're traveling. It's not comforting. You have to blind yourself. You basically have to just say, ignorance is bliss. What other risks? Let's talk about disease. You make a trip like this, uh, uh, inevitably you're gonna run into some kind of disease, aren't you? Well, yeah, and, and I've, I've had a few, <laughs> my fair shares of you know, close calls with um, you know, things that are airborne through uh, insects and malaria and, and things of that nature. And, you try to take precautions, but even in the best of situations, they don't always work. You could take methoclin for malaria, but that's a short-term drug. It's only you know, a couple weeks. And you use mosquito nettings, and you try to wear you know, very thin clothing at night. So, but you know, it's hot, it's very hot, and sometimes you know, you're wearing a thin long sleeve shirt and long, long pants so that the mosquitoes don't get you. And um, sometimes you start kicking blankets off and sheets off, and, before you know it, you get bit. Before you know it, the, the mosquitoes got through the netting and you got you know, you have a mosquito bite. Not all mosquito bites are gonna result in malaria, but you know, you know your chances are your chances. So how was it having malaria? Um, the malaria wasn't so bad, it was the cure. And what you do for the cure is you, you double dose the, the weekly um, intake of this methylquin and you literally are out of your mind. You're just out of your mind. You have hallucinations. I, you know, I, was, I thought I saw elephants peeking into the tent, which in fact they were, but <laughs> <laughs> I really thought. <laughs> Sometimes being out of your mind is not out of your mind. No, you, yeah, exactly, exactly. They, you know, they're looking down at you, you know, when you're sleeping in the three in the morning, and they just want to see who's in there. Uh, what else, what other kind of diseases did you run into? Well, there's Bahartsia, you know, things you pick up from the soles of your feet if you're in, um, you know, like lakes, uh, Lake Tanganyika and, and things like that. You. Um, you can pick up a whole bunch of critters. You know, there's yeah. a show on reality TV called the, um, oh, I, for lack of the, the critters inside me or something like that. <laughs> yeah. But there's all sorts of tapeworms and oh, horrible, nice. nasty things. That... So is, is there medical, uh, you know, care available that would help you deal with these things? Back in the early days when I traveled, the medical system kind of looked like um, the late 1930s in maybe uh, some parts of other countries. So they were very antiquated, but they were very proud of the equipment they had. And, and you know, it was a different style of medicine. In fact, instead of sitting across from the table, um, they would, you would sit next to the doctor and he would, he would hold your hand like this and talk to you. Make you feel better. Yeah, and then say, <laughs> oh, you're sweaty. Are you nervous? Or are you nervous because you're talking to me or do you have malaria? <laughs> you know, so that was, it was a, a, a kind of a, a ladder of inquiry. Were they knowledgeable? Were they helpful? Yes, they, they were. Did they, they were. actually give you care that worked? Well, some of it you would take under advisement and some of it you wouldn't. Um, you know, if they wanted to offer you diuretics and you know, you, that means you're gonna be going to the, the restroom every five minutes, but you're on a 14 hour bus ride, um, that's not that's the not best, work very that's well. not the best of ideas, so. So with the map, with the map, back to the map, um, where, where did you first land in Africa? How did you get there? And how did you travel between the countries that you listed? Well, what I try to do is just stay within one country on one trip. And that way you kind of get a feel for the particular culture of, of, of that particular you know, nation. 
And so um, I try not to travel around to too many other places other than this, the country I'm in. A lot of it for me is just a local bus. Mm. Um, sometimes you're lucky and you can, you can um, get on a train. Um, some of the trains are pretty antiquated and like pretty broken down. <laughs> well, if you take a, I always say, if you're gonna take a seven hour bus ride, plan on about 18 hours. Because inevitably the tires are gonna go flat and you're gonna have maybe two or three of those happen you know, along the way. And then something else happens. So it's, just, it's always something. So never, never say, okay, I'll, I'll be from this point A to point B in six hours. Plan 14 or 15 hours. So you went on to Travelocity and, and uh, got all these four-star hotels. Is that what you, you did to find a place to stay, Tim? <laughs> um, most places have no hotels. You're lucky to get a, a cheap pension or sometimes it's the local bordello. That's where you stay. Um, oh, interesting. You know you're in a bordello because there might be a, a small dresser and you open one of the drawers and there's maybe 50 or 60 condoms in, in the front desk drawer of, you know, but that's the only place really themselves off. Eh? Yeah, and, you know, and then there's, you know, late night ruckus going on and, um, and people going in and out of the doorways. And, but that's where you're going to stay because there's nothing else available. And so wow. it's just and, the way it is. You can't reserve it. I mean, they, they don't have a website. Eh? Things are changing. Things uh, are changing uh, now. It uh, used to be you roll it in a town and you go, maybe you find a couple places and you try to negotiate the overnight rate. Um, but now, even the smallest of little pensions, um, they have a website. And so people are making reservations. So traveling on the fly is getting much, much more difficult. It's not like, it's almost like here in the United States. You remember car camping? You just sure. get in a car and off you go and you pull in a little, you know, little town somewhere and you say, well, okay, put me up. Well, we're booked up. There's a, there's a softball tournament. Sorry. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. those days are, they're even disappearing from the United States. So um, how do you, oh, how about the food? You, you, you just, uh, do, you, do you know what restaurant you're going to eat in? I think I know the answer to this. You know what restaurant you're going to eat at in advance, or do you just find it on the fly? Find it on the fly, and rule number one for me is stay off the street. Now, no, and, yeah. I mean, no, no food on the street. I try not to. In the markets, the open markets. Yeah. I mean, Anthony, Anthony Bourdain <laughs> will not tell you it's the best right? place to eat. Nah, um, not going? if you don't want to have a, you know, a stomach issue for the next three weeks. Because yeah, yeah. remember, if you get sick, yeah. let's say you only have a month. If you get sick for a week... There's there's 25 percent of your trip in bed. Yeah. So you really have to think very carefully before your appetite uh, exceeds your 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 wisdom. They take credit cards. In some of the big cities, yeah. In the bigger cities, yeah. 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 But when you get out into the rural areas, you you better have local money and you better have planned your cash well throughout your whole trip because, you know, you might land in a large city, but then you will not see a major. Um, a major city for three weeks. So, so how do you plan your money? And then that's a whole other science of how do you basically stash your money away so that in case you are robbed or it's stolen, um, did they get the whole entire amount? So you have to, like a squirrel, place things in, in, in strategic places so that uh, that doesn't happen to you. Yeah, have you been robbed? Uh, close, very close. Yeah, ooh, interesting. Yeah, I was in the marketplace and it was getting late and a person pulled a machete and I don't know Swahili, but you know, um, I don't know what forces from nature put in some Swahili words in me, and I was able to utter them to the person with the machete, and it worked. I said, um, "Hatari, hatari means danger, danger." Mzungu is a, mzungu is the word for like white person, and kichwa is uh, crazy. So I said, "Hatari, mzungu kichwa." That was it. He's, he put it back. He goes, I think so. <laughs> that was it. That was the Who end. Who were you talking about? Yourself or someone else? I was talking to the person that was ready to rob me. And ah. um, I don't know where those words came from. I really don't. I mean, you do try to learn some of the basic words before you go any, any country. In Tanzania with Swahili. You should know Swahili. So not everybody speaks English then. Well, you, you have a mix. You have a mix. You don't know. If you're way out in the countryside, Swahili is the, the predominant word spoken. And, you know, sometimes English, because of the level of education, may not be order of the day. Take pictures? I try to, but I try not to. Um, <laughs> you know, your experience sometimes can be narrowly focused into the lens, right? And yeah, yeah. this is your best ph photography. This is your best computer. Yeah. Uh, I find that doing this and this with a, a journal sometimes is a lot more... Um, um, enriching to me when I come back and read it le years later or, you know, even, you know, shortly after the trip. I think when we live through a lens, um, it really limits why you're there in the first place. 
Yeah, but you did take some. Yes, yes. And it's those pictures we're going to take a look at when we come back from sure. this break, especially uh, a picture or two about a lion who was not too far away from where you were standing. Ooh. There's a few of them out there. Okay, All we're right. going to see some really interesting pictures when we come back. We'll be right back after this short break with Tim Apicella. Hey, hey, baby, that's you. I want to know, will you watch my show? I hope you do. It's on Tuesdays at 1 o'clock, and it's out of the comfort zone, and I'll be your host, R.B. Kelly. See you there. Hey, aloha. Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii, where community matters. This is the place to come to think about all things energy. We talk about energy for the grid, energy for vehicles, energy in transportation, energy in maritime, energy in aviation. We have all kinds of things on our show, but we always focus on hydrogen here in Hawaii because it's my favorite thing. That's what I like to do. But we talk about things that make a difference here in Hawaii, things that should be a big changer for Hawaii. Uh, and we hope that you'll join us every Friday at noon on Stand the Energy Man and take a look with us at new technologies and new thoughts on how we can get clean and green in Hawaii. Aloha. Okay, we're back with our host, Tim Apicella, who returned not too long ago from his um, regular sojourn in Africa, went to several countries in Eastern Africa, and he came back with stories and memories and a fantastic expansion of his consciousness. That's why he goes. And that's why we want to talk to him about it. And although he believes that your memory is the best photograph, he did take some pictures and we're going to see him now. So let's play the pictures, and Tim will describe what's on the picture. I love this shot because this is a typical gathering place for everyone. They're, you know, they're trying to get on transportation. There may or may not be a bus available for a few days or a week. So sometimes you'll see these little vans, um, the white little vans. And you'll get what normally would seat six people, you'll get... 12 people in there. <laughs> so it's a long eight hour ride, you know? So, but I love that because everyone, this is the gathering point for every community. They talk to each other? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of times though it is quiet. It's very quiet during the, the trip. And yeah. then if they bring out and singing, I love that. This is oh, beautiful yeah. voices. Sing along? Beautiful, I don't, I don't know. I don't. You can hum along. I, I... <laughs> what else we got? All right. Now, this gentleman was, um, we, we retained his services to go through the Okavango. Is that bullets I see? Those are fake bullets because he believed that lions smell metal. They know the recognized guns, spears. So when we were walking on foot for a day and a half, we had no machetes, no spears, no rifles, no pistols, nothing. Because the lions are intelligent. And if they think that you want to hurt them, they will kill you. And that's what he said to us. So, all right, go with that's that. KK. Um, again, there was times where I was able to go on a little safari, and so um, wild dogs are very, very rare, almost extinct at the time, and so to actually spot a wild dog is, is quite, quite a rare thing to do. Are they dangerous? Uh, when you're being hunted by them. If you're, if you're an antelope, yes. <laughs> okay, how about a human being person? No, nah, they, they, they won't go after Okay. You uh, wouldn't bring one home. This is the most dangerous animal uh, in Africa. Is that right? Yeah. It's a rhino. No, it's a hippopotamus. Pardon okay? me, what do I know? I have um, to make more trips. But if you look at his gaping maw, um, that's only half of what he's all about. This thing weighs over two tons and has, can run 35 miles an hour. So what's the fastest human? Not 35 miles no, an hour. Not close. So more people are killed by um, a hippopotamus than lions, um, you name it. What sets them off? Nothing. They have a very ill-mannered temper, and very a bad disposition. But well, we're not going to have any of them as hosts on our show. We shall not. I want to be clear about that. <laughs> okay. What else, you guys? <laughs> uh, jaguars are very, very. Excuse me. Leopards are very, very rare. And if you see one, you're really fortunate. And see the coloring. How he just kind of blends right into that that large yeah. tree limb. Beautiful. Yeah. You're lucky to, if you can get a photo of them. Elephants. Oh, so I love cute. elephants. The little baby elephant. The most intelligent in the animal in, in probably the world is they're elephants. They're family. It looks like and, a family. And they're all surround the, uh, the infant. Oh, that's beautiful. Next. Lovely picture. This is um, Ahmad. We hired him to um, basically, I, I was in uh, the Sahara with Ahmad for a few nights. And it was, you know, this is the desert, a few scorpions, and whatever he's going to cook for you that night. And, we would sing, and he would sing uh, The Camels to Sleep, and, and I'd do my best rendition of Frank Sinatra or not, and uh, we had a great time. What did he cook for you? 
Uh, usually some type of uh, a floured tortilla with uh -oh. you know goat meat or, or you know something. Just for interest, what did you have to pay Ahmad to come along? Uh, come along. You know, you negotiate these things. If you don't go through a guided tour, well, they'll you know they'll they'll stack the profit margins uh, exponentially. Yeah. You can do something like that for maybe forty dollars. To have him one day or for a week? Oh, for a number of days. Oh, that's pretty yeah. good. Yeah. Good. But you know, once you go through the the, the website tour companies. Uh, that's going to be uh, that's going to be a four hundred dollar five hundred dollar excursion. Mm -hmm. So what's next? I love this shot. Um, man's he's tending his camels, and um, this was in this was in Tunisia. And um, I, I, for me, taking pictures of people, uh, although it's very difficult because you don't want to offend them, um, that's where that's why I'm going. I'm, I'm going there to see people and 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 kind of see their environment, and how how they're taking care of their families and how they're making a living and, and how they're, you know, what their life experience is like. Did you get a pr permission for the shot? I did not. I did not on this particular one. And he didn't seem to, he didn't seem to mind. Um, you, you were not very far away from him. Well, sometimes the help of a telephoto does work. Yeah. I, I have a very small telephoto and um, he was looking in the general direction, but you know. If you, it's a beautiful picture, I must say. Thank you, beautiful. thank you. And I like the camel just to the left of the man. He's looking directly yeah, at he's the camera. Right he knows the story. Yeah, he knows he, well, he's, the, he's probably the watchdog of all the camels. So. <laughs> <laughs> they spit, by the way. They spit and they bite. Yes. They're not very they're not pleasant animals. Did you ride one? I have. I've ridden <laughs> quite a few. And, and they're, they're never, <laughs> they're just a tough animal. Yeah, you wouldn't take them home. I would not. <laughs> well, um, man, this when is you're in northern classical. Africa, you are constantly reminded of the Roman Empire. Because uh -huh. remember, in the Tunisia and, and all the Mediterranean aspects of North Africa was the breadbasket of Rome and, and, and Italy and the Roman Empire. So it's, you know, it's lovely to you be in Africa and then you get to go through some of the Roman this, ruins. This is in Tunisia? Tunisia? Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Ah, this is this, one of my favorite This now. shot. This yeah. shot is probably one of the rarest shots you'll see. Um, the gentleman who I hired for this had, you know, even on his vacation, he goes out in the bush with his family. I mean, that's what he does for a living for the last 35 years, right? So what he did is, you know, we were lucky. We just paid, you go through a lottery system. And he happened to be one of the premier safari guides at all the, the posh five-star hotels. Well, he decided to branch out on his own. And so he was a one-man operation. So what would normally have been a $2,000 safari a price tag, um, he's seventy-five dollars. That's fabulous. Yeah, and so what he what he said this was this that's a male cape buffalo, one of the the toughest animals to bring down. And the bottom line is he'd been waiting all his life to see this one particular event. And you'll see many lions. And by the way, females do all the heavy lifting. They're they're the ones that hunt. The, the male lion just sits around and what a life. Yeah. Well, it's you know sleep mate and to protect his border, but they do all the hard work. And yeah, yeah. so these lions, um, it took about seven females to bring this down. And also it took about a half hour. You, you shot this. I did, How yeah. far away were you? Uh, about 75 feet. You used feet. a telephoto lens? Yeah. Oh, but, you know, we were moving at the time. So trying to stand, hold, you know, hold it up and, and take the shot was, was really difficult. Was the lion aware you were there? Oh, they're too busy. They're too busy. too busy, but you have to be careful because they will divert their attention from what they're trying to do and say, ah, another ah, easy a, one, yeah. another piece of meat. <laughs> you know, so. Oh my God! Yeah, were you, were you armed? No, no. There's no. You don't bring any you arms. Just, you no. just run like. Yeah. <laughs> In South Africa, they used to carry rifles uh, for charging elephants and things. Again, depending on the country and your guide, if he has a philosophy that. We will bring no weapons because that will offend the lions, yeah. and he means offend them. Yeah, um, that's what you're doing. Yeah, you're really in harmony and you're on with foot. the environment. You're on foot. Yeah, yeah. You just hope for the best. Yeah. I, were you Were you worried at all? Yeah. You were. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we have that well, on tape now. I saw a, a, a <laughs> footprint of a lion footprint, and there was a wet spot next to it. That means it was urine. Yeah. And when it's 80 degrees, you figure, I'm not a science major, but the power of the evaporation takes about, what, 15 minutes in sand for, for liquids to dry out? Yeah. So that meant that lion left that urine and his paw print and was probably within the vicinity of 100, 100, you know, 100 yards of us. Yeah. But there's brush, and so you don't know if he's hanging out to avoid the midday sun in the brush, and you're standing right in front of him, yeah. and you don't know. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Now this this lion or lioness that's bringing the buffalo down, 
That was one. I can't see more than one. Is it? Yeah, there, there's several. There's one on that on his right leg, one on his left, oh, you know, left hind, yeah. and there's more coming in. And oh, um, they were all working on the buffalo. Yeah, it took quite a bit for them to bring it down. And and here's the rare thing: when they finally brought it down and, and were, were eating it, they usually call him the male because the male needs protein to defend the whole boundaries and, and territory. Mm -hmm. They didn't call him in, so they were very. That told me they were very they were hungry. hungry. They're very hungry, and they said, "Eh." Yeah. <laughs> Come back another first. day. <laughs> yeah. Let's go to the next one. Ooh. Okay. Um, I love the colors in Africa. I love the clothing. Yeah. Um, you have the traditional wear. You have just pants that are just multicolored. And that, so I thought it was an interesting. It's real African design. That's yeah. What that's just someone's this? laundry line. So. What country was this? Uh, that would have been Mozambique. Huh? The French. Uh, does that have a French? Portugal. Portugal. Yeah. Okay. Um, this was also Mozambique. And fishing, because Mozambique's on the coast, you have a lot of the old sailing dows. Yeah. That's your primary Is source. Photograph of... or art? It looks like art. Thank you, Jay. Yeah. Uh, there's you know a little shadow of the sail, and there's the sail. And yeah. thank you. That beautiful picture. All your pictures are beautiful, honestly. I try not to spend more than ten seconds to line up the shot. That's the way you got to go. Yeah, right it's real away. quick, real fast. Yeah. And if you can't get it, put it away. Yeah. Good. It works. Oh, this one too. Another beautiful picture. What yeah. Is this? this is how a lot of people get around on construction lorries. Um, you know, transportation is hard to find, and like I said, the the buses um, are usually privately run from companies, and they may maintain a schedule, they may not. So you may be expecting the bus on a Tuesday, and it just doesn't show. So now you're there for till Thursday. So people find creative ways of of getting from point A to point they B. They pay for this? Uh, yeah, they'll probably pay about ten shillings, and that's why the more the merrier. So the so driver what's that worth twenty cents or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just not much. Okay. Uh, let's try some more. Um, just saw the opportunity. Uh, she just seemed to be in a state of contemplation, and um, I loved her her headscarf, and um, I just loved how how the, sh the, sh the 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 shot came out. Yeah, contemplative. Typical uh, village in Botswana, out in the, the rural parts. Um, you'll see the the fence line. That's just keep out, literally keep out lions and hyenas and things of that nature. Love these guys. Um, this was Tunisia. We we're, I don't remember what, what village we were, uh, I was traveling into, but um, the guy with the scarf, he just had a way about him, and he, he was a bit touched, I think. He, I don't know if it was too much sun in his life, but he had some issues, and he would turn on the um, Arabic music on the, the cassette tape and start swinging that cane wildly, almost missing the driver several times. <laughs> and the driver was becoming very irritated. Finally, he said something in Arabic, we pulled over, and the two guys just got out and danced for about five minutes. He was exhausted, got back in, closed the door, it was silent for the next three hours. <laughs> and exhausted. He was exhausted. <laughs> we only have a minute more, so uh, take a couple of more pictures and we'll be done. It, it, no matter what age you are, you're going to be working, uh, you're going to try to help the family. You're going to help them, you know, bring revenue into the household, and these, these young uh, girls were selling pastries. And they knew you were taking the picture. Yeah, I actually did, for the, one of the few times, I actually gave them a, a, a donation for the, yeah, okay. for the opportunity. And this is more food than the this out. Yeah, this is just down, the, down by the docks. Mm -hmm. Notice she's doing all the work and all the guys are standing around. Yeah, I love it. Shooting the great breeze. culture, yeah. yeah. And last one now. Ah. There it is. I love, you know, when children play, they have very little resources. They really don't have, you, know, away. you won't see them with Nintendo. That's, that's his toy a choice for that day, and I just love watching kids play. So my last, my last question is, if you could turn to camera one for a moment, Tim. What's your advice to people about going? And, and if they decide to go, what's your advice about how they should conduct themselves? Well, if you go, um, conduct yourself that you are there for a reason, that is to basically learn from their culture, experience their culture, and so try not to be ethnocentric and, and bring your home place and what you do at home to the nation in which you're visiting. Um, enjoy the culture, enjoy the camaraderie of meeting new people and, and having them show you things that you would never see in your whole life. And um, try not to basically bring an agenda from home and uh, just, just go with it and have a great time. Yeah, so. thank you, Tim Apicella. Yeah. What a guy you are, no kidding. We're gonna look at more of your photographs and behind the scenes in a minute. We put that on our, on our other uh, playlist, which is called Behind the Scenes and people can see it there. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you for Dan. having me, Jay. It's great, a pleasure. Great Thank to you have so this much. discussion. I learned so much. Aloha. Aloha.